This is the last lecture from Chapter 6, Thermochemistry, and this lecture will focus on enthalpy. For our purposes, a change in enthalpy, delta H, is equivalent to the heat transferred. All right? Um, that is not always the case. That actually is only true at constant pressure. But as long as you're carrying out whatever you're doing under normal atmospheric conditions, your pressure is constant. So for our purposes, they are equivalent. Most of the work we'll be doing with enthalpy has to do with solving for the enthalpy change that occurs in a reaction. So the abbreviation we use for reaction is RxN. And the enthalpy change or the heat change or transfer during a reaction is equal to the sum of the enthalpy of the products minus the sum of the enthalpy of the reactants. So it's products minus reactants. Enthalpy is what we call an extrin extrinsic property, which you may remember from, I think, our first chapter. It simply means that it depends on how much of something you have. And so the more reactants we have in a chemical reaction, the larger the delta H or enthalpy change will be. So for example, one of the most common exothermic reactions, that's reactions that release heat, is our combustion reactions. In this case, we're combusting propane. That's what's in the gas cylinder if you um, have a gas grill. And combustion reactions are always exothermic. And so let me point out a couple of conventions. One is that for an exothermic reaction, you will always see a negative sign. The enthalpy of reaction that's given in a problem represents the heat change for the entire reaction as it's written in balanced form. So what this says in words would be 2,044 kilojoules of heat are released because of this negative sign when one mole of propane and five moles of oxygen are combusted. So keep in mind it's for the entire reaction as written. What if you were given a problem that said, rather than how much heat is generated per one mole of propane, what if you were asked what would be the enthalpy change for mm, three moles of propane? Oops. Okay, you'd have to look at the particular equation, see that as it's written, it's for one mole. And so in this case, it would be 2,044 times 3. Okay, so in other words, 3 moles of propane would release 6,132 6 kilojoules of heat. You don't always or the enthalpy doesn't always have to be discussed in terms of one particular reactant. It can be discussed in terms of any of the reactants or the products. For example, I may ask you, how much heat is released per one mole of oxygen consumed? Again, you need to look at this reaction. I think I better change colors. I'm getting messy. And say, okay, this 2044 kilojoules released was for five moles of oxygen. This problem is asking me how much heat has been produced if only one mole of oxygen has been used. And so I would have to take this 2044, remember the negative sign, and divide it by five, okay, to get how much per one mole. So it's a simple matter paying attention to the coefficients in the balanced reaction. There are a couple of manipulations um, for enthalpy of reactions that I want you to be aware of. And the first one is that if you have a balanced chemical reaction and you're given the enthalpy of reaction, the delta H of reaction, and for some reason that balanced reaction is multiplied by some factor, in this case times 2, 
Okay, so now look at this second reaction. Everything's been multiplied by 2. If that happens, you must also multiply the enthalpy of reaction value by 2. Okay, remember I said that enthalpy release depends on how much you have. So if you've doubled the amount you have, you're going to double the amount of heat change. The second uh, manip mathematical manipulation you may need to do with enthalpy of reaction is if a particular reaction is reversed. And so what do I mean by that? I mean that the products, which originally were carbon dioxide, become reactants. And the reactants, in this case, were carbon and oxygen, become products. That's reversing a reaction. If a reaction is reversed, its enthalpy changes signs. Okay, so note up here, the enthalpy change for the reaction was minus 393.5. When we reverse the reaction, the enthalpy change is positive 393.5. So another way to look at that is a reaction, if written in the forward direction, is exothermic, as this one was, designated by that minus sign. If we reverse the reaction, it is then exothermic as written. You might have wondered in the last couple of days if Q for our purposes is supposed to be the same as enthalpy of, of reaction or enthalpy change, then why do we have both of them and why are we talking about them in separate ways? Well, Q, if you remember from earlier in the chapter, um, was a term that we used when we um, did calculations to do with um, reactions carried out in a calorimeter. And the equation we used was what I called the MCAT equation, where the heat change was equal to the mass of the substance times its specific heat capacity times the temperature change measured. Um, so Q is really a term that's used when you're literally measuring um, heat transferred in a calorimeter in the laboratory. Delta H, for our purposes, on the other hand, is typically calculated. So it's not always practical or even possible to um, measure the heat exchange in a process or a chemical reaction. Sometimes it's more appropriate, easier, um, to simply calculate um, the heat change anticipated. And there are two common methods for doing that. One is called Hess's Law, and the other is using enthalpies of formation. Now, I want to mention here that there are more than one type of enthalpy. It's all to do with heat, but so far we've talked about the enthalpy change in a chemical reaction. And another term that's coming up pretty shortly is the enthalpy of formation. I just want to point out at this point to pay attention to the subscript that goes next to the delta H value. That subscript will tell you what enthalpy the problem is referring to, and it's pretty important to note the differences. So let's get started with Hess's Law first. In very simple terms, Hess's Law says that if you don't know the enthalpy change of a reaction, so in going from, let's say, reactants to products, if you don't know that delta H value, you can estimate it. If you're able to find other reactions that add up to give you the overall reaction you're interested in, you can add those individual steps. You can add the delta H of those individual steps, and you should be able to come up with a pretty good estimate of the overall enthalpy of the process you're interested in. So Hess's Law simply tells you you can add together little pieces of reaction to get information about an overall reaction. And so here's kind of the book definition and the diagram if you want to look at them a bit more. Before we get started um, doing some examples of Hess's Law, there are two rules that you need to keep in mind that are similar 
to the manipulations I showed you early on in this lecture about delta H. So one of the rules in doing a Hess's Law problem is if you end up reversing a reaction, remember the products become reactants, the reactants become products, you must change the sign of delta H. So if the sign was originally a plus, it becomes a minus. If it was a minus, it becomes a plus. All right, if the reaction you're looking at ends up being multiplied by some factor, could be multiplied by two, it could be divided by something, could be divided by two. But whatever you do mathematically to that equation, you must do the same thing to the delta H value. So if you multiply all of the reactants and products in a balanced equation by two, you must also multiply the change in enthalpy by two. Here's an example of Hess's Law. You need to really be attentive here and put the video on pause whenever you need to to fully understand this. Overall, it's not difficult, but it has a bunch of little parts that you really need to pay attention to. All right, so in a Hess's Law problem, you will typically be given two or three reactions that I want you to think of as puzzle pieces. Okay, And those reactions, your goal is to put those reactions together in such a way, add them, subtract them, multiply them, whatever, so that ultimately you end up with the reaction of interest, the target reaction. So a problem will very typically ask you to manipulate the top equations in such a way to get the one they're interested in. So notice that the puzzle piece, the top given um, equations, that the enthalpy change for each of those is known. But the enthalpy change for the, the reaction of interest is not known. All right, so I'm going to go through how to work this out. On the next page, I want to point out the process by which I do it, though. All right, so what you do is you look at each puzzle piece reaction. So I'm going to look at C2H2 first. And you ask yourself two questions. The first question should be, are the reactants and products in this on the correct side of the arrow compared to the target reaction? So look at C2H2, for example, and in the given reaction, it's a reactant. Look for it in the product. In the product, excuse me, in the target reaction, it's a product. So they're on opposite sides. You never, never manipulate the target reaction. Never change the target reaction. You can only change the given puzzle piece reactions. So we have got to reverse this first reaction so that the C2H2 and the other ones are on their correct sides. Do you remember what I said to do when you have to reverse a reaction? You must then change the sign of delta H. It was negative, so I'm going to change that to positive. This will be a little more clear in the next page, too. Looking at the second puzzle piece reaction, um, I'm going to look at the reactants and products, see if they're on the correct side. I can see right away that they are. Here's carbon. It is a reactant on both the puzzle piece reaction and on the goal. So I do not have to reverse this reaction. However, now I want you to look at the quantity of each of the reactants and products. Notice that uh, there's only one carbon in the puzzle piece reaction, and yet look at the target reaction, there are two. Remember, you, you're not allowed to change the target reaction. So I have to go up to the puzzle piece reaction and multiply all of the coefficients by two. Um, remember what I said to do with delta H. When you multiply by any factor, you have got to multiply the delta H value by the same factor. And again, all these calculations will be on the next page. I'm just kind of taking you through the thought process. Finally, and I'm going to get rid of this green marker because it is too hard to see. 
All right. Um, we're on the last sample reaction, puzzle piece reaction. And I'm just going to, you can look at any of the reactions or products that are easiest for you to make a judgment about. But I'm going to look um, for hydrogen. I see it's a reactant here. It's also a reactant in the target reaction, so I do not have to reverse the third reaction given. Let's look at quantities. Um, I have one diatomic hydrogen molecule in the target reaction, and I also have one diatomic hydrogen molecule in the puzzle piece reaction. So you totally leave the third puzzle piece reaction alone. It has the correct quantities. Things are on the correct side of the arrow. So now let's go to the next page and see what we do with these modified reactions. All right, so this is a summary of what I did or what I talked you through on the last page. Um, here's the third reaction. We kept it the same. Okay, we didn't change anything. So delta H is the same as it was in the given problem. Um, the reaction, um, the second one, I believe, uh, we had to multiply. We did not reverse it, but we had to multiply all the coefficients by 2, and therefore we had to multiply the delta, given delta H value by 2. So we have a new delta H for that reaction. And finally, this was the first one on the last page. Um, we had to reverse that reaction so that C2H2 was on the product side as it is in the target reaction. In doing so, we had to change the sign of delta H so it is now positive. And that was it. So now you simply pay attention to all of your new delta H values. You're going to add them all together. Be very careful of the signs. All right, so not only do you add together your delta H values of the modified reactions, you also literally add together these three puzzle piece reactions once you've modified them. Don't add them together before you've like multiplied or reversed them. So what do I mean when I say add together chemical reactions? Well, every single reactant in each of these needs to be added together. Okay, so that's what I've done here. And this 5 halves O2, I probably should have shown that work, but that comes, if you look at, we have two oxygen from um, the top reaction right here, and then we have another half oxygen right here. Okay, so two plus one half is two and a half, and another way to express two and a half is five halves. That's where that came from. Anyway, so hydrogen, CO2, and water. So I literally added together all of these reactants from all three reactions. Then you put your arrow sign, and now you add together all of the products. So what are my products? Two CO2, H2O, C2H2, and 5 halves O2. Um, okay, so now you have them all added together. Now you have to simplify it if possible. So if you have the same thing on both sides of the arrow, you go ahead and cross it out. So I have two carbon dioxide on each side, I have water on each side, and have 5 halves oxygen on each side. So I cross out what's the same and then rewrite what's left over. And guess what? This is my target reaction. That is how you show your work to demonstrate that you have, in fact, combined the given reactions in the correct way to achieve the reaction of interest. So, but you're not done because what the problem asks for is what is delta H for this? So now delta H you get by adding up the um, modified delta H values. And so when you add all the delta H's from the three different reactions, you get that the overall delta H for the target reaction is 226 kilojoules. Voila. All right, so now here's one for you to try. Um, so 
as always, I strongly recommend you pause the video and you go through the same process I went through and see if you can get the answer for this problem. And I'll work it out for you on the next page. All right, you can see how similar this problem is. You were given three puzzle piece reactions again. These are not really called puzzle piece reactions. That's my made up word, just so that you know. And here is your target reaction. And you are supposed to find the enthalpy of reaction for the target. So let's go through that same process. The first reaction given, so you've got to find if the reactants and products are on the correct side. O2 does not even show up in this target reaction, so that's not going to help me. H2 does not show up either. However, fortunately, before you give up, OH does show up, and it is on the right side. It's on the correct side. It's a product. So we do not have to reverse the first reaction. Are our, are our quantities correct? No. Okay. The given reaction has two OHs, and we only need one. So we have got to divide everything in this first reaction by two. Or you can think of it also as multiplying by one half. Same thing. Which means we need to divide our enthalpy value by two. So if we were to rewrite that first equation, it would be one half O2. And it's okay to have fractional coefficients because you're just playing a math game at this point. One half H2 equals one, well, OH, I'll leave the one out. Okay. All right, let's go on to the second reaction. Let's see. Again, O2 does not show up in the target reaction, so it's not going to help me. However, single oxygen does. However, it's on the wrong side. It's here on the product side in the given reaction, and we need it on the reactant side. So we are going to have to reverse the second reaction which means we need to change the enthalpy sign to negative. Are the quantities correct? Well, no. The given reaction has two oxygen. We only need one. So not only are we going to have to reverse this reaction, we have got to divide it by two, just like we did the first one, which means we divide delta H by two. So if I were to rewrite the second reaction, remember I have to reverse it and divide by 2, I would get that ox single oxygen, get, I'm reversing it, gives me 1 half O2. Kind of weird. All right, let's look at the third reaction. H2 does not show up in the target reaction, so it's not going to help us, but H does, single H does. It's on the wrong side again. So we have to also reverse the third reaction, change the sign to negative, and we have two times too many. So we've got to divide this third target equation by two, um, and so we also need to divide delta H by two. Now I'm going to open up a new page to kind of show all these calculations. Alrighty, so I have rewritten each of the three given reactions with the manipulations we made, and I've also gone ahead and corrected the delta H values for the manip manipulations. Now, when you add all the delta H values, you get that the overall delta H of reaction is minus 426.5 kilojoules. Don't forget units, okay? Now, you still have to show your work by adding together the three reactions. And so, I'm going to combine all of the reactants. Everything on the left side of an arrow. I'm going to draw the arrow and I'm going to combine all of the products, everything on the right side of an arrow. And then I'm going to look and see if I have anything that is the same on both sides. Let's see, 1 half O2 can be crossed out. And 1 half H2 can be crossed out. And then I'm going to rewrite what's left. 
to verify that it is in fact the target reaction, and it is. So delta H for this target reaction is minus 426. All right, so we are done with Hess's Law, but that's something that definitely takes some practice. There, I probably made those two practice ones a little too similar. They can be quite challenging, kind of like the difference between balancing an easy equation and a really hard one. So go ahead and practice several of those, please. All right, the other way that we will commonly use to calculate um, the delta H of reaction, the heat of reaction, is by using a formula or using enthalpies of formation. I'm going to tell you what those are in a minute, but please notice the difference in the subscripts. Okay, they're two different things. The book definition, now this is an important one to know, so you'll want to write this one down and highlight. Book definition for enthalpy of the formation is the amount of heat needed to form one mole, that one mole is important, of a compound from its elements. So you literally take a compound, you break it into every single different element, and the elements must exist in their standard state. What are standard states? They're a little different here. Uh, at least the temperature is different from what you're used to dealing with gases. Standard state for um, chemical reactions that are not gases, um, well, it could have a gas involved, so that's still one atmosphere. If it's a solution, the concentration that's considered standard is one molar, one mole per liter, and the standard temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Notice if we're doing gas laws, standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. We're not doing gas laws. All right, this is really important. All right. When you're, we're going to end up adding and adding together a bunch of enthalpies of formations for different compounds. Okay, If you have an element in its standard state, its heat of formation, delta HF, is zero. So any element in its standard normal state, so that could be any of the diatomics, okay, and they're all their gas form, or any element, a metal, whatever, the, in their standard state. Now, if you start seeing a cation, okay, that's an element, but it's not in its standard state. Elements don't exist as cations in their standard state, so you've got to pay attention to that. Neutral element as it normally exists, delta HF is zero. In order to work out calculating the heat of reaction, uh, you will be given a table or a list of a bunch of heat of formations for all sorts of different compounds. All right? So you'll have to be able to use this list. You simply go to it. Um, and there are tabulated known values, a heat of formation. Pay close atten attention to the units. Sometimes they're joules, sometimes they're kilojoules. And pay attention to the sign. All right, I want to walk you through for another slide what I mean by heat of formation. It's it's very important concept. I gave you the definition. I said, you know, it's the amount of heat absorbed or released in forming one mole of a substance from its individual elements in their standard state. So let's say I asked you to write the heat of formation for carbon monoxide. It may seem straightforward. You may go, okay, yeah, there's one carbon, one oxygen, and there you go. Um, you would actually get that wrong. So let's think, let's analyze this a little further. Part of the definition is that the elements must be in their standard state. Okay, so, well, carbon's a solid in its standard state. We'll show that. Oxygen does not exist as an individual atom in its standard state. It's one of the diatomics. Remember Hofbrinkel? So you have got to put oxygen with the subscript, too. That's how it exists in its standard state. Now look what has happened. When you've done that, you don't have a balanced reaction anymore. Um, you don't want to change. Um, part of the definition for heat of formation is you make only one of the product, one of the compound. So you don't really want to change that. 
if you were to balance this reaction in a normal way, okay, you would end up with the following, right? But there's an issue with that because the heat of formation is for one mole of the product, and now we have two moles. So this is another case when it's okay, and in fact you have to, <clears throat> Manipulate mathematically so that you only end up with one mole of the product. So we're going to go ahead and divide all of the coefficients by two so that we only end up with one carbon monoxide. So you are going to, in heat to formation, very commonly, you're going to end up with fractional coefficients so that you only have one of the product. That's perfectly fine for heat of formations. Make sure that you can go through this process um, because it will show up on your test. Here's a typical multiple choice question that involves um, your knowledge of enthalpy of formation, delta HF. So <clears throat> let's say I gave you each of the following reactions, and I said which of these, if any, represents the enthalpy of formation for the compound shown. So um, let's look. Well, if you got to remember there are two parts of the definition for enthalpy of formation. The first part was that the reaction must show the production of only one mole of the substance. So right away, we can cross out B. It's not representing enthalpy of formation because it's making two moles of the product. And C, we can cross out because uh, it's reversed, really. So the product, which is glucose in this case, is the individual elements are, in fact, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they're supposed to be shown as reactants. So the first reaction is balanced. It has the elements in their standard state. Sodium is a metal and is, in fact, a solid in its standard state. Oxygen is written as diatomic as it needs to, and the reaction's balanced. So there we go. What if I asked you to change the ones that had an issue with them into an equation that did represent the standard um, heat of formation? All we would need to do for B is to divide all of the coefficients by 2. So if I rewrote that, I would have 1 potassium. Oh, by the way, potassium is not a liquid either. All metals except for mercury are solids. All right. And now we have 1 half chlorine and one KCL. Oops, that's an L. So now that would represent heat of formation. And for the bottom one, simply reverse it, okay? Because we have one molecule of the product as long as we reverse it, and we have its elements in their standard state. So that's it. So, after quite a long discussion about heat of formation, what is the new formula we need to use to calculate enthalpy of a reaction using these magical heat of formations? The formula says that the enthalpy change in a reaction is equal to the sum of all of the heats of formation of the products minus the sum of all of the heats of formation of the reactants. So you're basically going to get go to that table of heats of formation. You're gonna pull out the values for all the products, you're gonna add them together, and then you're gonna pull out the values for all the reactants and add them together, and then subtract the two. N and M are the coefficients in the balanced equation, so right here. So if your balanced equation shows, for example, that you have three carbon dioxides, you look up the heat of formation for carbon dioxide, and then you multiply it by three before you plug it into this equation. So let's go ahead and do one. All right, here's our combustion of propane again. <clears throat> and here's our formula rewritten. 
So if you go back to the table I gave you, and of course on the tests I would need to give you a table or a list, let's add up all of our products first and make sure you pay attention to the coefficients. We have three carbon dioxide, so three times the heat of formation of carbon dioxide, which happens to be minus 393.5 kilojoules. We're adding all the products together. We have another product. It's water. Be careful on this one. Every now and then, if a combustion gets hot enough, you actually temporarily produce water as a gas, water vapor. So pay attention to these states of matter in the balanced reaction and make sure you get the correct heat of formation. So heat of formation for liquid water is 285.8. There are four molecules of water. Now put closing brackets because this is the equation more than any of them where it's easy to mess up your signs. And then you do the same thing with your reactants. Okay, so it's products minus reactants. Final minus initial. That's always the case. So <clears throat> the reactants, we have propane, C3H8. There's only one of them. And its delta H of formation is minus 103.85. Now, you don't even have to show it for oxygen. Hopefully, you remember that the heat of formation value for any element in its standard state is zero. So, I can't tell you how many students during the next exam will raise their hand and say, um, they'll be looking at the heat of formation table and they'll say, um, you forgot to put oxygen on the heat of formation table. And I really can't say anything. The problem is they have forgotten that heat of formation for elements are zero. So they don't show up on the um, table of values. Okay, so now you just do the math. Um, I would actually walk yourself through and do that um, because make sure this negative sign in the middle gets distributed. I would just do all the math inside the brackets first. Um, but the value you should get is that the heat of reaction for the combustion of propane is minus 2219.9 kilojoules. So I want to remind you to make a note to yourself that delta H of reaction okay, is one thing, one type of enthalpy, and delta H of formation is a different type. Okay, I don't want you to get those mixed up. All right, so here's one for you to do. Calculate the enthalpy of reaction, so that's delta H of reaction. Okay, using the enthalpies of formation. So the first thing that you need to do is to write out a balanced combustion reaction for C6H6. Okay, I've been asking you to write balanced combustion reactions since the beginning of the semester, so I'm hoping you can do that. Um, so just a reminder, the one of the reactants has to be oxygen, and the products are always carbon dioxide and water. So go ahead and write a balanced reaction for that so that you know what the products and reactants are. And then remember the equation we have for calculating the heat of reaction from the heats of formation. So it's the sum of heats of formation <laughs> okay, of all the products minus the sum of all of the heats of formation for the reactants. My handwriting stinks. Okay, so you have two things to do. Write a balanced reaction and then write out the formula for the products minus reactants. You can go back a few slides to the table that shows all of the values um, for heats of formation. Alrighty, so you probably, because of me being on my soapbox, um, wrote your balanced reaction with whole number coefficients, which is usually what I ask you to do. So if you did, that's awesome. That is correct, okay? Um, let's see. All right. um, but
but it's going to change the values that you have in your delta H reaction, which is fine also. So, so either way is fine. Either way you'd get full credit for. So the enthalpy of reaction uh, is heats of formation of the products. So, of course, I did it with this fractional balance, so we'll look at that just for the purpose of clarifying. We have six carbon dioxide, so um, six times the delta HF value for carbon dioxide. We have three waters, they're liquid waters, so three times minus 285.8. Put your brackets around your products so you don't mess up your signs. Um, and then let's see what our reactants are. Anytime you have a combustion reaction, um, it's kind of nice because you know you have molecular oxygen and elemental oxygen, so the heat of formation is zero. And the way I have it balanced, you only have one C6H6, and so its delta HF value is 49. So if you do your math correctly, you will end up with a... Delta H of reaction equal to minus 3267. Now, if you balance the reaction using whole numbers, you're going to get a value of delta H times times 2 to that value. Because remember, delta H depends on how much you have of a reaction. And if you balanced it with whole numbers, you're actually burning 2 moles of C6H6 instead of 1. Either way is perfectly fine because I did not specify in the question. That's it for enthalpy. That's also it for Chapter 6 about thermochemistry.